Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Everyone can hear me. Excellent. Um, so, in this talk, I want to tell you a little bit about how, um, well, we heard quite a lot about the geometric Langlands program uh, so far in this conference um, and possible connections to gauge theory and string theory. Here I want to tell you about um, what's sometimes called uh, well, the classical Langlands program or the number theoretic Langlands program, or at least uh, some elements thereof and how they uh, play a role in string theory. Uh, so we start with some basic motivation, um, <coughs> tell you something about how you should think about modular forms or automorphic forms uh, from a more representation theoretic viewpoint. Uh, and then in the third part, I will um, focus on some specific uh, VPS couplings in string theory where this, um, this is important. Uh, so this, this is based on uh, work over a number of years, in particular work with um, Axel Kleinschmidt, Philip Fleig, and Gustafsson. So the reference at the top there is, is a book we've been working on for about five years, and it's supposed to be uh, finished very soon. And we, during this work, we kind of, well, many conjectures came up, as Alexei said, was it this morning that it's easy, it doesn't cost anything to make conjectures, but it's hard to prove them. Uh, so that's what we are doing at the moment. So there is a paper coming out on Friday where we prove some of these conjectures and then there is uh, upcoming work eventually where we prove more of them. Um, <coughs> so what we want to do, we want to understand uh, string theory or some uh, interactions in string theory. and. What we will be focused on here is that these are usually very constrained by symmetries, in particular in this talk, um, we have supersymmetry and u-duality. So these uh, combined say that these amplitudes will have some intricate arithmetic structure. Um, G of Z here is supposed to indicate some discrete Lie group. And we learned a lot from this. We learned. Uh, some lessons on ultraviolet properties of gravity. You can learn about non-perturbative effects like instantons. And maybe the main part uh, is important for this talk is that we can also make interesting predictions uh, for, for mathematics. So to be a little more precise, this is all so far in the context of toroidal compactifications. You can consider more general compactifications, but I'm not going to do that in this talk. So then we have this famous chain of duality groups culminating with E8 in three dimensions. And the basic uh, lesson here is that the physical couplings will be some kind of uh, automorphic objects on these coset spaces. But you can make that point more precise. Uh, so let's look at some specific case of higher derivative corrections in type 2 string theory. So we know that uh, the first non-trivial correction is uh, contraction of four Riemann tensors. The next level we have derivatives of that Riemann tensor. And they all come with some functions. I call them F0 and F4. And they are functions of the moduli. And we want to determine um, what these functions are. So we know they must be functions on the moduli space. So they are functions on En plus 1 in this convention over K. K is the maximal compact subgroup. They should be invariant under this discrete symmetry. But they must also satisfy some differential equations um, due to supersymmetry. And we know there is a well-defined weak coupling limit. So they have some uh, growth conditions. And if you combine all this, these are exactly the defining properties of an automorphic form according to well, Harish Chandra originally. So this makes us, you know, it's interesting to try to understand if there are functions out there that uh, we can use. So that's what I want to do in this second part. So when a mathematician talks about an automorphic form, well, we have some data. Well, the basic data is some, some Lie group and then some arithmetic subgroup. And the definition is, um, well, I almost 
just gave it. So it's some smooth function, some complex valued function on the group that satisfies three basic conditions. Automorphy, it should be an eigenfunction of the ring of differential operators on G, and there should be some growth condition. This means that, for instance, things like the J function does not qualify as an automorphic form, if you like that. Uh, so this is a little more restrictive. But functions that do are like Eisenstein series, non-holomorphic Eisenstein series is a basic example of an automorphic form. And it's also one which will... Um, hmm? Sorry? Yeah. It's not an eigenfunction of the Hecke algebra and so on, so it's, it's not the, uh, yeah. But what, what happens if you try to go away now from this, so we saw an Eisenstein series, you can think of it as a function on the upper half plane, but this is specific for SL2. So if we go to some higher rank groups, we want to replace this notion with something that uh, uh, works in all cases, and then the representation theory uh, is helpful. So let me introduce some objects, big objects. Space of automorphic forms on a group G, some infinite dimensional function space. I mean, you can, if you want, you can restrict to, say, square integrable functions. It's part of that. Sometimes people do that. Um, what's important is that this group carries an action of G. So you can just act with the so-called right regular representation. It's just translating the argument on the right. And then this is still an automorphic form. And that's the definition of an automorphic representation is if you take this space and you think about decomposing it with respect to this action and you take the irreducible constituents, those are automorphic representations. And this is a huge uh, program to, to do this and because this is a non-compact quotient, you actually have contributions which are both discrete and continuous the discrete spectrum is generated by so-called cusp forms. Um, <coughs> they are uh, functions that have zero constant term. So this term here is an integral over so-called unipotent subgroups. This must vanish. And the continuous part is actually generated by Eisenstein series. And those are the ones that are most relevant for this talk. So let me take an example. Uh, by now, an old and famous example. The R4 term in 10 dimensions, this has a, a function F0 of tau, tau lives in the upper half plane, and you have um, an expansion where the first two terms here are the perturbative and one loop contributions. The parameter Y is the inverse of the string coupling. And then you have an infinite series of instanton corrections. So they are exponentially suppressed in the weak coupling limit. And they are quite hard to calculate explicitly. But as it turns out, you can sum up this entire series into one function. And it's precisely an Eisenstein series of the type I showed you before with a specific value of the parameter. So in this uh, context, the the term in above here is the, in the exponential is the instant on action. And the prefactor here, sigma, is, is a combinatorial divisor sum that we call the instant on measure. So this was a very successful um, result. Gives you a non renormalization theorem that there are no higher perturbative contributions. They are prevented from SL2z invariance and supersymmetry. But what if we now go to lower dimensions with higher and higher rank symmetry groups? Can we repeat this uh, successful story? And um, so as I emphasized, the key thing here is that we have instanton effects appear as Fourier coefficients. Now, computing Fourier coefficients uh, is quite easy in this case, but if you go to, to higher rank groups, it's more difficult. So we want to use some uh, math trickery, so the so-called Adelic framework. So as, uh, quoting Langlands, he says, an efficient but abstract way to approach the subject of automorphic forms is by the introduction of Adels. So they are ungainly objects that nevertheless 
<coughs> once familiar spare much unnecessary thought and many useless calculations. And so we kind of took this at face value and, and, and now I think I agree. Um, so just to give you sort of the pictures, we are interested in some kind of Fourier coefficients of Eisenstein series. And um, this so-called adelic framework allows us to consider more general objects, adelic Eisenstein series, where we can compute Fourier coefficients with uh, additional techniques that are not available in the, uh, down here. And we can restrict. And then we can extract the objects we're interested in. So let me just give you some indication of, of why this works. So if you never heard of the Adels, maybe some of you have, it's this, this comes about if you're looking for completions of some number fields. So let's look at Q here. You can take completions with respect to the order and Euclidean norm, and that brings you to the real numbers. But you can take completions with respect to another norm, periodic norm, and that gives you the periodic numbers. So by convention here, Q infinity, this is sort of the prime at infinity corresponds to the real numbers. So why is this interesting? Well, if you then take this R and QP for all primes P, and you cook up sort of a global object, the Adels A, by taking the product over all this QP, well then an Adel X is just sort of a collection of, of these um, different numbers corresponding to the real place at infinity or some of the periodic numbers. Now, the Q here embeds very nicely into A, and this is a discrete embedding. And here's one of the main points, that it's easier to work with Q than Z. So the embedding of Q into A is like the embedding of Z into R, but Q is a field and Z is a ring. So this makes things uh, nicer. And actually the first to realize why this, this uh, sort of um, structure is very helpful was Tate. In his thesis, he developed Fourier analysis over the Adels. And one very nice example is to look at the Riemann zeta function, or the completed one, which has a functional equation, xi goes to one minus xi. And this is kind of tricky to prove if you just um, uh, take the Riemann zeta function at face value. But what you can do is you can consider the Euler product of the Riemann zeta function, like this, and then the prefactor involved in the gamma, you can actually attribute to the prime at infinity. And then you can write the whole thing as a very nice integral over the Adels. And so Tate did this and were able to show functional equation and an elliptic continuation of xi in a much uh, simpler way. So what we are going to do is we're taking this group G, we're considering it as um, G of Z will be G of Q inside the Adelic group. The space of automorphic forms is enlarged. And what we want to look at are Eisenstein series in this context. So I haven't really told you what I mean by an Eisenstein series on a higher rank group. So here it is. I'm taking uh, a sum over orbits of the group G of Z. And this H here is sometimes called a logarithm map. It's a map from the group G to the Cartan subalgebra. And it depends on a choice of weight, lambda. This is a weight of the Lie algebra, or a complexified weight. And this generalizes the S parameter I had before. And now what we do, we do the same thing, but we treat the, gr the, the group element G as an Adel, and then we sum over the rationals instead. Oh, sorry, yes, we're doing this for, this is a Borel subgroup. You can do it for other parabolics, but I will restrict to Borel here. Uh, so once we have this formalism, we want to look at um, very specific representations that actually correspond to BPS, uh, sort of has a BPS analog in string theory. So in general, the, all these things, these representations are very complicated, but there is one representation that is kind of like the, the simplest possible thing you can look at here. And these are called the minimal automorphic representations. Um, here is a definition. Um, representation pi factorizes into product over primes. And it's minimal if each factor has the smallest non-trivial functional dimension, or Gelfand-Kirillov dimension. 
So this is just if you're thinking of, let's say, square integrable functions on Rn, the gelfand kirillov dimension is n. So it's just a way to characterize these functional dimensions. And for our purposes, the key thing is that automorphic forms, realizing these representations, have very few non-vanishing Fourier modes. And this is precisely where the BPS condition enters. So let's look at some um, specific cases. We are interested, well, for first and foremost, we're interested in sort of the, the, the E6, E7, and E8 cases that appear in this uh, toroidal compactifications on string theory. And here I've listed the functional dimensions. They are 11, 17, and 29 for E8. And we can look at um, this Eisenstein series that I just told you. But what we want to do, we don't want to look at just generic weights. We fix a very specific weight. So we take this lambda to be 2s. Capital lambda 1 is the fundamental weight associated to, lo to the node 1 in the Dinkin diagram. And s here is a complex number. So this means that we arrive at an Eisenstein series on an exceptional group that has a parameter s, just like we had for SL2 r. And then there's a theorem, first due to Ginsburg, Rallis, and Sudri, and then extended by um, GMV, Green, Miller, and Van Hove, saying that if we're looking at E6, E7, and E8, then the Eisenstein series that I just defined for you, E2s, for s equal to 3 halves, is uh, attached to the minimal representation. And then this is precisely the Einstein series that actually enters in the R4 corrections in, in string theory. So what we want to do, we want to try to calculate Fourier coefficients of this Eisenstein series to extract physical effects. So here's kind of the, the current state of the art knowledge um, of where these functions enter. So in this BPS couplings, um, for the R4 term, this Eisenstein series of S equal three halves and for the d to the 4, r to the 4 terms, it's the same Eisenstein series, but evaluated at 5 halves. And that turns out to live in the next to minimal automorphic representation. And in terms of BPS states, this is like half BPS and quarter BPS. So let me just say something about what we want to do when we calculate Fourier coefficients. Well, what we, what we can do is that when you have just a SL2, well, then there's just one cusp to expand around, but when we have, let's say, E8, we can consider all kinds of uh, different expansions. We can take a decompactification limit, we can take string theory limits, we can, say, take the M-theory limit, where the M-theory torus uh, <coughs> is large, and so on. And this corresponds to choosing different parabolic subgroups. I've indicated them in these Dinkin diagrams. I can, I can remove a node. Let's say I take the top one here, this is E8, if I'm removing the, the rightmost node, I get E7, and that's precisely the symmetry that you have in one dimension higher. So what we want to do, we want to calculate the general Fourier coefficient. So here I've just written out what such a general Fourier coefficient looks like. The psi here is, is like a generalization of e to the 2 pi i x, the ordinary Fourier mode, and very little is known in general in this case. Um, but there is an important result of Miller and Sahi. They say that, oh, if you have E6 or E7, then all Fourier coefficients in the minimal representation are completely determined by much easier objects. They are so-called maximally degenerate Whittaker coefficients. So they are coefficients with respect to just N, the unipotent of the Borel, and the character here just feels a single simple root. So these we can calculate. And the goal in, in what we have done is to try to use this to extract information about arbitrary uh, parabolic subgroups that are relevant in string theory. Now I'm sort of short of time, so I think I might need to skip something. Sorry about this. Um, then there is a similar type of uh, a story for the s equal to 5 halves. Eisenstein series, so this is supposed to be now the next to minimum representation, so it's relevant for the d to the 4, r to the 4 term, 
And uh, what we have, so based on basically uh, explicit experimental calculations, we came up with the following conjecture that um, all the Fourier coefficients in this next to minimum representation should be com completely determined by two very simple coefficients that we can actually calculate. Um, where this, this one here, psi, is a character that only feels uh, pairs of commuting simple roots. And this is what we have proven now in, for SLN in a paper that will come out this week. And we're in the process of pushing it to, uh, to the exceptional groups, uh, hopefully later this, uh, this fall. So I should say that there are some already results for this d to the 4, r to the 4 couplings that we hope to uh, well, reproduce and then maybe extend eventually to extract these instanton effects. Um, so let me end with just some comments on what one might like to do uh, further on. So you can go to say 1-8 PPS couplings, um, d to the 6 star to the 4 and so on. Now it's interesting because there suddenly um, string theory seems to produce objects which are no longer automorphic in the strict sense. They satisfy uh, more complicated differential equations and so we are sort of outside of the realm of the ordinary uh, theory of automorphic representation. So we need to somehow have some new, uh, new techniques there. Of course we want to go one step or two or three steps further down to say two, one or zero dimensions and then we get uh, Katz-Moody groups, so E9, E10, and so on. And we also have actually results uh, partly motivated from string theory that indicate that there is a very nice and rich theory of automorphic representations also for Katz-Moody groups. And this is something that as mathematicians are working on uh, sort of in parallel. There seems to be, I just want to mention, there is some interesting connections to double affine Hecke algebras uh, that we're trying to, to understand and seems to be some, some interesting relation to this um, Eisenstein series on E9 and E10. Okay, so thank you very much.